James Com James Com and I'm not on my bike today because it's raining. But we are here at the Whitney. And we're gonna go up and drop in for the press preview of Jay DeFeo, a retrospective. Okay, so we're up here on the fourth floor. And uh we're going to start out following the show chronologically. Now, I guess Jay DeFeo was born here somewhere in the, the Northeast and uh, moved out to California and was raised out there as a California girl. This is a gallery of her early works on paper. This is Untitled Tempera and Ink on Paper. And I believe this might be one of the earliest pieces of the show. This is 1951. And uh, in the press release, they say that uh, she went to school in uh, Berkeley, I guess, and uh, actually received a traveling scholarship and was able to go to Europe for a year and a half. This is titled Florence, 1952. And I guess she may have done some of these temperates while she was there. This is nice. This is titled Untitled Florence 1952, but uh, get up and look at the facture here. You can see that she's got uh, already got the pigments starting to build up in the impasto. Some more of her uh, studies. Now, uh, but this is an interesting piece because uh, it's also from Florence. She got a little cruciform in there and. Uh, I think that a lot of this work almost has kind of a religious, almost like an icon form. It's also untitled. Some of her early sculptures. It makes me think of a Cy Twombly, but uh, she was probably about uh, 10 or 15 years ahead of his uh, of sparse white pieces. The wall text says that uh, Jay got busted for shoplifting paint. And uh, <laughs> having worked at Utrecht, I know that that's a real uh, problem. But uh, she decided that she needed to have some kind of income so she could afford to buy her materials. So she started making jewelry. And evidently, these are examples of some of her pieces. And uh, this was her main means of support for several years. Well, this is nice kind of a gallery of some of her early large drawings. But this was nice. This is a large uh, charcoal and Conti on paper. It's kind of made me think of Morris Graves, who was uh, a real presence there in the uh, Northern California, Southern uh, Oregon area at the time. This is an illustrated history of the universe from the mountains. Oil on masonite mounted on board. And uh, aside from the kind of chunky nature of that, that's almost uh, like a new image piece. This was a surprising piece. Large painting, but uh, a lot of her work is black and white. And uh, I just went to a Jim Dine show last week and uh, maybe I'll splice some in there. <laughs> it's got a series of paintings that look remarkably like this. some of her kind of uh, funky collages. It's called Aplan and the Black Fact, 1958. And this is Blossom, 1958. Well, 
I think Jay DeFeo is one of these artists that has so much myth and uh, legend wrapped around her and her milieu. And uh, that's why a show like this is so great, because you have a chance to see what all the hubbub is about. It's untitled from 1957. Now uh, we're gonna enter the, uh, I guess what I would call the, the main showcase gallery. So these are probably her great mature works. And, uh, oh, there's the director, Ed Weinberg, down here in front of her masterpiece, The Rose. When I was 15, I ran away to Haight-Ashbury and uh, ended up flopping in a commune that was only a few blocks away from where Jada Feo's studio was where she painted The Rose. Years later, going to school at uh, the Art Students League on the GI Bill, this was during the advent of neo-expressionism. There were a lot of people like Schnabel and Kiefer and, and even Basquiat that were doing these huge paintings with all kinds of stuff thrown into them and sticking out of them. But uh, the legend of Jay DeFeo's painting sort of hung over all this, some kind of grand fantasy. And when I heard that uh, it was held behind a wall at the San Francisco Art Institute, that even increased the mystery. So about uh, 20 years later, Elisa Phillips curated a show called uh, Beat America, somewhere in 1997, 98. And uh, at that point, they had gone out and got the piece and they'd restored it. And when I initially saw this piece after my first rush, I was kind of disappointed. But uh, the more I thought about it, the more I looked at it, the more I've seen it over the years. I've uh, kind of thought about Dave Hickey's terms He's saying that uh, sometimes unmet expectations are just as important as met expectations. And the more I look at this, the more I kind of admire what uh, Jay had done with the restraint and uh, just making a statement about painting as a language. Now, she was one of the few women that was featured in the 1959 16 American show at the Museum of Modern Art. And her husband, Wally Hendrick, was in that show. And also, there are a couple of uh, young New Yorkers that were kind of debuted in that show. Robert Rascherberg, Jasper Johns, and Ellsworth Kelly. Oh, well, I guess we're going to start. Welcome to the DeFeo Chapel. Um, I'm Adam Weinberg, Alice Pratt Brown, director of the Whitney. And um, I'm so pleased to have you all here this morning for Jay DeFeo, a retrospective, I think the title appropriate, very appropriate, because it is the first full retrospective of Jay DeFeo's work wow. ever. This exhibition brings together 150 works from 1951 to 1989. It includes paintings, sculptures, drawings, collages, photographs, and even jewelry. DeFeo was a key artist of the San Francisco art scene that included such figures as Bruce Conner, Wallace Berman, Manuel Mary, and Joan Brown. Her art was deeply connected to the Beat Generation's artistic activities, such uh, writers and poets as Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, Kenneth, Kenneth Rexroth, and Lawrence Ferenghetti. In fact, at the Sixth Gallery, where um, DeFeo's work was exhibited in the 1950s, um, Ginsberg presented his first um, a reading of Howell in October of 1955. Um, perhaps she was mostly overlooked because of the legend of Jay DeFeo. In a way, the rose, which is an extraordinary piece, um, she needed to be rescued from the myth of the rose, in a sense. Um, the rose was created uh, between 1958 and 1966, and during that period she worked almost exclusively on the painting, and she layered and layered and layered and chiseled and chiseled and chiseled and scraped and scraped and scraped and began again and again. The massive painting was already celebrated within art circles when the movers came in 1965 with a forklift to extract it through the wall of DeFeo's studio. And although DeFeo has been primarily identified with the Rose, her career, as you can all see, I think for the first time, is much more than this one great singular painting. As DeFeo wrote in 1959, only by chancing the ridiculous can I hope for the sublime. 
Only by discovering that which is true within myself can I hope to be understood by others. The Whitney has championed DeFeo's art for the past 20 years, and we're very proud to possess the largest collection of J. DeFeo's work of any institution. We saved the rose, I would say collectively we saved the rose, um, from oblivion in the 1990s, with crucial aid from the DeFeo Trust and from the Judith Rothschild Foundation, and it was former Whitney curator Lisa Phillips, who is now the director of the New Museum, who did her amazing exhibition um, uh, that was called Beat Culture of the New America, 1950-1965. And Lisa was um, one of the people most responsible for rescuing this piece, both literally and historically. And Jay DeFeo set a fiercely independent course and created an astoundingly diverse body of work. Her art from the early 1950s established a set of visual concerns, and Adam and I did not compare notes before, so <laughs> a couple of these things are uh, repeated. Um, a set of visual concerns that can be traced across her career, a primarily geometric vocabulary, the presence of a central form or imagery, and attention to surface texture, and groupings of works that explore varying expressions of a seminal idea. Her early work was frequently three-dimensional, including the delicate metal sculptures and jewelry pieces, which are in the cases in the first room. In 1954, Deveo married fellow artist Wally Hedrick, and the following year, they settled into a flat with studio space at 2322 Fillmore Street in San Francisco. The building was inhabited by a rotating cast of fellow artists, poets, and musicians, and it would be a hotbed of creative activity in the city for the next decade. In the mid to late 1950s, DeFeo made a group of enthrallingly large-scale works using a palette knife to apply layer upon layer of paint. These are the works that are surrounding you right now. The highly textured surfaces would become a hallmark of her oil paintings and would culminate in the creation of works such as the jewel, the red one right over there, and the rose, and certainly the incision as well. The rose occupied DeFeo almost exclusively for nearly eight years, and when she finished the work, it is estimated to have weighed more than 1,500 pounds. And I say estimated, you'll see a number of figures out there um, for the weight of the rose uh, back in 1966, or the weight of it now. No, nobody truly knows. We're all just guessing. We think it was about a ton at the time, and probably close to 3,000 pounds now with the addition of a metal frame and brace in the back. Um, but it's never actually been weighed. Um, the work was exhibited publicly only twice during DeFeo's lifetime, both times in 1969, um, and I should say in both of those cases it was against a black wall, which is what DeFeo approved of. The rose was then brought to the San Francisco Art Institute, where it was installed in a conference room. In 1974, when it became apparent that the rose was in need of conservation, a plaster coating was applied to the surface of the painting in what was meant to be a temporary conservation effort. So it was obscured from view from that point in 1974. And a series of complications, including financial complications, meant that that later conservation never occurred. And with no further progress, five years later, a false wall was built in front of the plaster covered painting, obscuring it for the next 16 years. So the work was um, unavailable from 1974 to 1995, 21 years. In the spring of 1988, DeFeo went to the doctor with a cough and was diagnosed with lung cancer. But she continued to work prolifically, producing smaller scale oil paintings and works on paper. Some of those works on paper have stark silhouettes, but they always have luscious surfaces. DeFeo lost her struggle with lung cancer on November 11, 1989, at the age of 60. Certainly the rose functioned as DeFeo's compass as she labored over it for those eight years. But it is only once the myth of the rose, seductive as it is, has been dispatched that one can see the scintillating, fearless work of a career that lasted four decades. And that is my hope, that that is exactly what you will see illuminated here in this exhibition. So, thank you for coming. This piece is titled, The Jewel, 1959. And I first saw this piece out in LA last summer. And, uh, I think it's a great example of some of her mature work, and this obviously is a precedent for the rose, but uh, she's got a lot more color in there. It's another uh, kind of an eye-opener. It's titled Incision. 1958 to 1960, and uh, see if we can see the strings and things she's got hanging out of there. 
and uh, I don't know, this is almost like draping jewelry on something, so maybe uh, there was a feedback between the, uh, the jewelry making and how she was thinking about her, her paintings. This piece is titled Dr. Jazz from 1958. And, uh, well, you can see that she's also got a lot of scribbling drawing in there with looks like graphite pencils. And, uh, I like this up at the top. It's almost like bare canvas. And, uh, it's like a gravitational force dragging down all the, all the gestural brush stroke and paint. Oh, this is a very impressive piece. Uh, this piece is titled Origin. And uh, it's during the introduction by the curators. Uh, they talked about how Jay was very much kind of involved in almost a spiritual quest and it's kind of typical of, you know, the proto-hipster or proto-hippie sense in San Francisco, the kind of seeking some kind of spiritual transcendence. But I love the way that she is, uh, you know, she's very disciplined with her gestures and very uh, kind of methodical about building these these images out of these strokes. This is a great painting. Well, we're coming into the gallery that uh, features the work that Jay did after she took about a four-year hiatus after finishing the rose. And uh, I think she might have moved out of San Francisco and uh, kind of gave up oil painting, and at that point she took up a lot of work that was more involved with photography and collage. It's titled Study for September Blackberries, 1973. And uh, she also started painting with acrylic. These pieces are titled Crescent Bridge, and uh, almost like the subtlety of her modeling give these images the quality of a uh, black and white photograph that she's collaged in. I like this photo, untitled Armut's Cast. 1973. Oh, this is titled Cabbage Rose. It's a synthetic polymer and oil on panel. Oh, there's a little assemblage piece she was doing. So this is a gallery that is dedicated to her photography. Oh, that's collaged. Untitled 1973. Yeah, it's interesting how uh, 
this actually relates a lot to her painting. Even the kind of uh, glossy surface that you get on the emulsion on these prints. Well, these are some rather odd pieces. It looks like she's uh, playing around with the chemicals and the developers and stuff. Kind of makes me think of some of uh, Man Ray's experimental photography. Oh, that's nice. Untitled Salvador Dali's birthday party, 1973. And I've got a nice uh, selection of her drawings. I mean, she was a very good draftsman, and uh, she almost has a uh, an illustrator's precision. And I think that a lot of this was uh, based on some of the photographs that she was taking. This is interesting. So we've got photographs of camera tripods. And these very detailed drawings are more studies of the tripods. She has almost uh, anthropomorphized these. Somewhere between uh, photorealism, surrealism, and uh, precisionism. It's titled Reverse Water Goggles. More water goggles. Now, some of the, uh, the mechanical qualities of these drawings recall uh, Maccabi and Duchamp back during their uh, Dadaist period. Well, this gallery features some of the late paintings. I guess she, uh, she kind of stopped doing the large-scale paintings for about 15 years after she finished the rose. And uh, these are some of the works that were completed between 1972 and 1980. This is Cygnus. And... Uh, this is acrylic collage on canvas. It's a diptych. Now she's getting much more precise in some of these later pieces, getting more geometric. This is called Masquerade in black. Synthetic polymer and mixed media on masonite. Looks like she might even have some chalk drawing in there. It's a nice little splash. Well, these two pieces were kind of surprising because uh, Jay always seemed to basically favor a very simple palette of mostly black and white, maybe some grays. This is verdict number two, 1982. And she's got some collage in there. And uh, you can also see that she's starting to use some masking tape. But she still has her drips. You know, the other way, the other thing is that uh, the way she's kind of centered her images on these monochrome grounds is kind of uh, relates to no image painting. It's titled Verdict. 
and I would say that's probably about uh, eight by six feet. I like this some collage of her photographs, four gelatin prints with masking tape on board. Well, I guess these are the last large-scale paintings that she did before she got sick. So these are from the late 80s. Black Nile. Oh, that's nice. She's got some raw canvas she's leaving in there. This piece is titled Geisha One. And uh, since she worked on this one for a couple of years, So it's interesting the way she's uh, she's playing off this very kind of formalist precision with the kind of the underlying drippy mushy expressionism. So these are the late pieces, I guess, from the last year of her life, 1989. That's a nice pink cup by day. And although she was sick and probably knew she was dying, she kept working on some of the smaller scale oil paintings. That's nice. That's probably about uh, 12 by 16, something like that. But uh, she's like proportionately pretty thick stretcher bars on there. It's called white water. Black Canyon oil on linen. Home with the view. Down one. Huh. This appropriately is titled Last Valentine. This is uh, James Calm reporting on Jay DeFeo, a retrospective here at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Thank you, Kate. Well, thank you.